Welcome back, Star Pilots. It's GR here for Player Base. Thank you for waiting. We've been working away in the background, optimizing our workflow and technical equipment to get these videos out as quickly and as regularly and as qualitatively as possible. I promise you that your patience has not been in vain. Today, we are going to talk about how to read a character sheet and also, as a result, how to play. This is intended for people who have either never filled out a character sheet before or played the game, or people who have maybe done it once or twice, but usually online and the computer kind of does it for you. This video is meant to do two things. One, demystify and give you the ability to properly read and integrate the information on a character sheet. Two, as a result, understand exactly how and why that empowers you to play more easily, more freely, more satisfyingly. As we go through this, I want you to try something a little different. In the description for the video, there are links to these character sheets, this one, this one, even this one, both as regular PDFs and as form fillable PDFs. And if you can, print them out and do them by hand. But if you can't, use the form fillable ones. And below that link, I've even included links for dice. There are two links for the dice. One for 5d6, so that you can roll the character ability scores. And another one for a d20, so that you can play along with the character sheet. So as we go along, pause the video, rewind the video if you need to, and take as much time as you need to fill the form out. One last thing about that. In order to avoid the very reasonable and common choice paralysis, what could I do? Well, I, all these many different things. I'm gonna give you a quick way to cut right through that. I want you to design a character so that you can do it quickly and easily and not be too invested in it that you would never want to play. Say, for instance, a rock gnome AdSense executive, half Air Ganassi data mining analyst, something like that. This way, when you're working on the character sheet, you won't get tripped up worrying about whether or not this is the best way to play this character or if the options are the most desirable because none of that will be a concern for you. The other thing is, just so that you have it, below the dice is another link for class and race abilities. You can search between them. That might also be helpful. All right, let's go. Basically, there are essentially two types of game. One kind of goes like this. Your friend slides forward. Grabbed by creatures can now feel the heat of along the wall. Grab for my large knife and I swing out immediately. It moves out of the way silently, almost imperceptible. The blade that you have in your hand. And the other one kind of goes like this. As you what was open that? the door to the tavern. Ooh. Does yeah, it, uh, a, does it have a um, screen open? Uh, and it shows uh, you getting uh, the killed punch immunity? and Judy show. I also have a ring oh, of oh. making sure that I win. There are two important aspects of the differences between these two styles of game. The former, a more immersive, role-play-heavy style of game, involves the opportunity for the character to make mistakes. The latter, a beer and pretzel style of game, or air conditioning for your brain, like a Square Enix product, is meant to minimize mistakes by the player. Now, those two things are very different. In the former, play is optimized by the character being able to make regular human mistakes. Not only does this engage the player themselves in the character and the believability of the world, but allows everyone else, essentially gives them permission to participate more freely and fully in that same activity. Even the Dungeon Master. In the latter style of game, really, someone isn't so much playing the character as they are playing the character sheet. And both their intention and their objective is to optimize the mechanisms on the character sheet so that the player doesn't make any mistakes with the character. So the character never makes a mistake because the player never makes a mistake. But interestingly, in both cases, if you know how to read a character sheet, you will make fewer mistakes in either option. If you can read a character sheet for what it is meant to convey, which is how your avatar operates in the game, and if you understand all of the mechanics on the character sheet, which allows a beer and pretzel style player to fluidly optimize their activity, you can get more out of both style of game. So it may have been that you have been to a table, seen it online, and seen all of these dice and thought, oh man, that's a lot of dice. Fear not, because really most of them are for hitting something with your axe or your spell or what have you. Really there's only one die that you have to worry about, and that is this one. Now, 
the D20 is meant to do everything that you could possibly do. The D20 has been around for literally thousands of years. Greeks and Romans used it to play games. Ultimately, all dice come from the same place chess and checkers come from, cards, cockle shells that you throw up in the air, which either fall flat or on their curve. You can go to India and play Parcheesi with men playing with cockle shells right now. Unless you really know what you're doing, I wouldn't recommend it because they do know what they're doing. The purpose of the D20, which has a 5% chance to land on any one of the numbers, it is meant to roughly estimate the phenomenology of a complex environment or set of systems when two agents are in a contest of wills, be it directly or indirectly. What do I mean by that? Well, a direct contest of wills would be the player fighting a goblin. Those are two active participants. An indirect contest of wills would be the player attempting to get open a window to someone else's house. The person whose window it is and the people who made that window are not there, but they don't want you opening the window, and you doing so is a contest or an overcoming of an obstacle or barrier. All of the numbers on a character sheet are meant to give you a rough rule of thumb for an equivalency on how good someone might be at something for lots of different reasons, which is why you might come to the same strength number in vastly different character types for vastly different reasons. Or you might be equally good at opening a window due to your strength, manual dexterity, and coordination, or using magic. Now, generally speaking, it's been the rule since time immemorial that a one, regardless of whatever advantage you might have personally, is considered a critical failure, meaning no matter what the score is, didn't work in the way that you intended it to. And 20 is considered a critical success, meaning it really worked. And that can mean all sorts of things, like not only did you get the information you were looking for, but there was an added bit and a map included. You hit the thing and their head explodes. Or you were able to circumvent a whole series of problems that you didn't even know were sitting under the surface and it became revealed to you in a very interesting way. But critical failures can be just as lovely. What can happen is not only did the thing that you were intending to do not happen, but as a result, something completely unexpected did happen. And lovelies, I can assure you that the reason you are here, whether you know it or not, is to experience the unexpected. And that is one of the many reasons why being able to read a character sheet and being confident you as a player are not getting in the way of you allowing your character to make mistakes. The world opens up in ways that you literally could not imagine. You may have noticed that on the side of the sheets, or in some cases in the middle, there are these six ability scores. Now, roughly put, you can divide them into body, mind, and soul, or if you prefer, body and mind. What these are meant to emulate is all of the ways that your character has agency in the world. So for body, you have strength, pretty obvious, dexterity, which is the coordination or ability to articulate that body in a given way. And they're rough numbers because they're meant to approximate a whole bunch of different things that could come up to the same thing. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say you are an elf who's 6'2 and 190 pounds, very lean, very lithe. You might, as a result of that, have a strength of 16, which means that you are more than better than average. 10 is the average across populations of humans and other races that play in the game. So anybody who has a 10 isn't really better or worse in that given ability range. But if you have 16, you're better than most people at it. So let's say you're a dwarf who is 5'2 and 190 pounds. You might also have a strength of 16, but for very different reasons or put together very differently. And as a result, that elf might have a dexterity of 14 or 16 or even 18, but that dwarf might have a dexterity of 12 or 10 or even 8. Now, as we go down the list, we have constitution, which is your ability of that body to withstand a harsh environmental and climactic effects like poison or noxious gases or fried jalapenos. And it affects mostly how many hit points you get per class per level. Along with that is intelligence, which is the ability of your mind to perceive and collate information. So it affects things like how well you can look up something in the fantasy Dewey Decimal System in the Arcane Library or how apt you are to read more than one type of language. Wisdom, on the other hand, is the ability to collate that information and apply it into 
different characteristic circumstances, like whether or not you should be so overtly looking for information in the Arcane Library when you very obviously don't belong there, and therefore how to play it off, or how to talk to shrubbery, you know, druid stuff. Charisma is very often mistaken for attractiveness. And indeed, being attractive can increase your charisma, but we've all known someone as beautiful as you can imagine, all the force of personality is this tablecloth, which isn't much because this isn't a tablecloth. It's a scarf that I use to contrast with the black background. Charisma is force of personality. It's the ability for the psyche of the character to wield and command the attention and activity and even the interest of other entities, which is why charisma is both how the cleric turns away undead monsters and the necromancer controls them. It's also how the actor is able to move people's emotions and perhaps even their political opinions with a performance or a speech or an impassioned diplomatic request, as well as even someone who maybe is not so good with words in the heat of the moment, being able to convince someone who isn't necessarily on their side to work with them because of the common danger. So we understand now that 10 is the average, and above that is better than average, and below that is worse than average. The way that we get these scores, there are a few ways. There's the standard array, there's the point by system, but more often than not, and what I'm going to suggest very heavily that you do here, there is the classic dice roll. Now in the old days, we would roll 3d6 in order, and that was the order of your ability scores, and what you got, you got. And from that, whatever you could be, that's what you could be. There's some fun to that, but these days we're a bit more forgiving, and we usually roll 4d6, and then we put them where we want them. The 4d6 is, we roll 4, and then the lowest of those d6s we throw away. However, sometimes, if the dungeon master's being particularly generous, or, such as this case, where it's your first time, we roll 5d6, and that's what the link is for. It's your first time, and I want this to go well for you, so I suggest you try the 5d6. Once we have those ability scores rolled, and we've decided where we want to put them, and if you're not sure, just put them anywhere. This is your first time. This doesn't have to be written in stone or even in pencil. You can just type it out on the form fillable and throw it away later. Then we're going to work out what the other number is. And that other number, which has a plus or a minus next to it, is the advantage or disadvantage that that ability gives us. This is meant to facilitate, when we're attempting some act of agency in the world, how apt we are to be able or likely to do it. Now, for certain things like opening an unlocked door, it doesn't require any role. But in other cases, such as where there is some contest of will or obstacle, say, for instance, the door is stuck or the door is locked, then a roll with a d20 comes into play. And we add to that d20 number the advantage or disadvantage that our ability gives us. So if we have to shoulder a, a door open and we're really strong, we add that strength to our roll. That is what the plus or the minus is. And how we get to that roll is we take the number above or below 10, however many spaces away from 10 the number is, we divide that by 2 and we round down. So a strength of 12 is a plus 1, but a strength of 11 or 10 is a plus 0. A dexterity of 8 is a negative 1, but so is a dexterity of 7, whereas the dexterity of 6 is a negative 2. Does it make sense? It's a little tricky, but this does two things for us. One, it gives us a number which models well to the d20 system, and the other one is, because we can increase slowly over time our ability scores, it allows us to modulate how that would happen and the minimal difference it would give to the player. So if you were in the gym for a long time and working out really hard, or say you were studying for years at the academy, you might get a little smarter. The other thing is the number uh, is much more impressive when it's twice as big. And so it feels more satisfying, which is why we have the two of them really. Now added to that ability modifier, which is an advantage or disadvantage, we have our proficiency score. And you'll notice that on some of the sheets, the proficiency scores are next to the abilities and not in alphabetical order. This is for ease of use because each proficiency has a certain relation to a certain ability. So for instance, using history or arcana, those are intelligence. Doing magic tricks, sleight of hand, picking locks, uh, or walking a tightrope, other acrobatic skills, those are dexterity based abilities. Now, the proficiency score, which is how proficient we are at something, is meant to indicate training and time spent practicing. So if you're a professional locksmith or thief, you will be better than someone who is as handy as you are, who hasn't spent their time and their livelihood and their attention and their focus doing that thing. And just like a profession in the mundane world, the more you do it, slowly over time, you get better. And just like the mundane world, over a broad span of the populace and a broad spectrum of skill sets, people get about as better as pretty much everyone else in about the same amount of time. Meaning one person might be a savant and be a master at something 
in six months. But if you take a thousand people doing that one thing, be it accounting or sword fighting or um, commanding vampire thralls, people pretty much do about the same much better over the same amount of time, which is why your proficiency score, which is above your ability scores, goes up the same for everybody level per level. And it doesn't go up every level because it's meant to indicate that you improve slowly over time. If this is hard to think about, imagine you were looking for a plumber or a carpet cleaner or a locksmith. You would want someone who had been in the business for about 10 years because no matter how smart or dedicated or disinterested in their job they were, someone who's been at it for 10 years is likely to have seen most problems and been able to work out how to solve them, including yours. And they're much less likely to have a really big mess up. Now, in some cases, you can double your proficiency score. Oops, all sorts. And you might want to do this. But that's usually with feats, and this is a first-level character, so you don't really have to worry about that. I just wanted you to know in case it came up that that does exist. And that's also why there's two bubbles on some of these character sheets. One last thing about ability scores. Generally speaking, your racial choice will give you certain advantages. For instance, all elves get an advantage in dexterity. Wood elves get a bit more wisdom. High elves get a bit more intelligence. Often, a given profession will have a set amount of proficiency scores that you can choose from. If you're not sure, that's what the link to the race and class tables is for. Also, it doesn't matter. This is your first time, and you can draw all over this thing in magic marker and crayon if you want to. Look, look at what people do. Look. No one will stop you. Look, 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 look. In fact, I mean, look at all these. I encourage it. Whatever you want, it's yours. As we're going through the sheet, let's do the bits at the top. Initiative is the advantage you have when rolling the d20 to dictate where you are in the action order. This usually, and almost universally, is just for combat. Who goes first? And most of the time, this is pretty much just a straight adding of your dexterity modifier, but other things can affect it. Move or speed is how much distance you can travel over one round of combat. Six seconds. Characters get 30 feet or 10 meters, six squares, five feet or a meter and a half feet. Wood elves get an extra one at seven squares, 35 feet, 10 and a half meters. And dwarves, halflings, gnomes, things like that usually get less, like 25, five squares. Now, in those six seconds of combat, you can just run, in which case, instead of taking another action, you double your movement distance, which would be 12 squares, 14 squares, or 10 squares. And inspiration is simply a little extra D6 that you get when you do something that is in character with the character, but not in line with the most optimal path necessarily, which is to say, this is exactly that sort of thing where your character makes a mistake, but the player does not. So you might know not to interrupt a captain of the city guard while they're interrogating you, but knowing the features and the characteristics of your character's personality, they might be apt to. Way of encouraging and enticing players to act and become involved with their character so that they're not so divorced from it that they're constantly scanning their sheet to look for the most optimized strategy. This allows for the whole game to run more smoothly, but also to be far more engaging, far more entertaining, far more satisfying. Mechanically, what inspiration number is, and it's usually just one, although some dungeon masters let you stack them, it just allows you to roll a d6 and add that number to anything. A d20 roll, a damage roll, a saving throw, whatever you like. You can even give it to other people if you want. If you want to really get the most out of this game, you will find looking for ways to get an inspiration bonus in as many ways and as many chances as possible is the most rewarding avenue to true success, which isn't necessarily winning. A little bit about where the terms HP and AC come from to give you a sense of what they're modeling and then how we use them. Hit points and armor class come from the beginning of the game where you're modeling, one, how hard something is to hit, and two, even if you do hit it, what kind of barriers there are to the strike penetrating. Now, hit points are actually a subsidiary of hit dice, the amount of dice you need to roll to hit something. So if something had a hit dice of 4d6, you needed to roll at least 4d6s at the right amount in order to strike the opponent. Which is why if you had 8d6, you were better off because you only had to roll four of them the right amount. These days we think of it as health, but it's really more grit or stamina, destiny. Think of hit points as your Han shot first score. Han is a great space pirate, but a laser blast will kill him just the same as any normal route. The 
HP that he has is his ability to shoot first. Han shoots first in front of an enemy who is about to shoot him. That takes a certain amount of HP. So his Han points, if you like. As he gets into more and more situations where someone's about to shoot him and he shoots first, his hit points go down to where he no longer has any Han points or grit or stamina and the other person does in fact shoot first and that's the end of Han. And that's why we have saving throws because once you actually get struck with a big axe or a magic missile, big rock, things are not going so great. This used to be really complicated, but these days a death save or a saving throw is just roll 10 or above three times. And if you don't and you roll nine or below three times, which is okay, then you can just roll up another one. That's what all that is meant to me. One last thing about magic users, if this is your first time playing, there are a number of numbers which go into magic use, which can be a little confusing. This is a first level character, so really all you have to worry about is you have cantrips and you have level one spells. You have spell slots, which is usually two or three. Depending upon what type of magic person you are, sorcerer, warlock, regular old wizard, you have a list of the types of cantrips and the types of level one spells that you can choose from. Depending upon which one of those you are, you get a certain amount of them that you can choose. Usually your intelligence or your wisdom or your charisma score, whichever one is associated with that. So for druids, it's wisdom. Sorcerers, it's who knows. And for wizards, it's intelligence. For warlocks, it's charisma. You get that many more spells. So let's say you get five spells, but you got a charisma of plus three, of a 16 in charisma. So you get to choose eight spells. And you can choose from the cantrips, level one spells, however many you want. Let's say you choose two cantrips and six level one spells. You only have three slots, which means that you can use one level one spell three times or twice and one other spell or three different spells out of those six once per day per long rest. If that is a little complicated, might be better to just start with a warrior or a barbarian. You really don't want to be worrying about all that at first. No one is really going to notice probably and it can be forgiven. If you have any questions or require any clarification, please write a comment. We'll address it either directly in the comments or with the daily 3CSD five minutes of raw, uncut, off-the-cuff responses. I'm GR, and this is PlayerBase. Thank you very much. We are happy that you're here. As you what was open that? the door to the tavern bathroom, you are greeted by yeah, I get like a, plus a beast forever of indescribable to, horror um, with not getting seven hit. tentacles of uh, uh, sexual healing that is, do does plus it have, three damage um, to your ability mm. to do this right. Oh. Ooh. Does yeah, it, uh, a, does it have a um, screen open? Uh, and it shows uh, you uh, the Punch immunity? and Judy show from All that right. one episode of my, uh, um, Lucille Ball and uh, uh, third level sanity door damage of, uh, plus 15 uh, against destruction uh, to, uh, hold on wait a minute uh, uh, with my uh, I also have a ring oh, of oh. making sure that I win yeah there's um, also uh, well, some I kind of so. on oh, your no. save wait a minute when uh, it, it, you need to and snack also in hand, uh, take into account um, that you um, can in fact completely destroy yeah, whatever uh, is there behind that guy there's so, also uh, like three stabs. Yeah, actually, hold on. Um, uh, the, I also the I have a um, of being stabbed is uh, there, uh, and you will get stabbed unless um, a, a telephone. Matt Smith, of, did you? Uh, are you phoning a friend? Yeah, no. And, I mean, I guess um, I. You know, uh, it's no, it's no trap. Matt Smith but comes I, in. Oh, okay. And I, I, um, oh, a bow tie somehow helps us. Right? Yeah. No, it's a plus three bow tie. Yeah.